let's take a look at an amazing yet simple story in the Torah, in, in the Navi, in the prophet. This is a story of uh, a woman who came to the prophet Elisha. Elisha was the, um, the prime pupil of Eliyahu, the prophet of Elijah. And he was the prophet of the generation after, after Eliyahu. And the Torah records a number of miraculous things that Elisha did, showing his authority over nature. Of course, Eliyahu, his teacher, his master, had performed great miracles, but Elisha's miracles were even greater. So one of the stories is as follows. One woman who was a wife of a student prophet, because Elisha had a school, he ran a school to teach prophecy. You had to prepare for prophecy. It didn't just come spontaneously. So there was a school where people studied to prepare for prophecy. Some became prophets and some did not, depending on whether God chose them. This woman was married to the prophet Ovadia. The prophet Ovadia passed away at a young age. It was in a time when Israel was besieged by its enemies. There was terrible poverty and hunger in the country. And uh, Ovadia passed away young, leaving bills, unpaid bills. The uh, loan shark, from who he had taken a loan, was coming to collect his debt and uh, there was nothing to pay him with. So he was demanding that the widow's children, Ovadia's children, should sell themselves into slavery to him to repay the, to repay the debt. So here's how the story is written in the Torah. One woman, the wife of a student prophet, cried to Elisha. And she said, your servant, my husband, has died. And you know that he was God-fearing. And the collector is coming to take my children as slaves. Elisha says to her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She had already sold everything of any value. And she said, I have nothing in the house except a pitcher of oil or an oil pitcher. Elisha said to her, go and borrow empty vessels from all your neighbors, get as many as you can. You'll come back to your house with all these vessels and you will lock the door and you will pour from your oil pitcher into all the empty vessels you've borrowed. Miraculously, the oil is gonna flow. And this is olive oil, not crude oil. It's gonna flow from the pitcher until all the vessels will be filled. So she goes and she borrows the vessels and she brings them home and she closes the door and her children are handing her the vessels and she is pouring the oil from the pitcher. And when, the pit, when all the vessels were full, she said to her son, hand me another vessel. And the son said that we have no more, mess, no more vessels. And the oil stopped. Of course, she then sold the oil and paid her bills and lived comfortably on what was left over. Going over the story just a little 
with a little commentary. She comes to Elisha, the holiest man of the generation, because she has a financial problem, a debt that she can't pay. Elisha is not offended. He's, he's not, he's not uh, surprised by the visit, even though he is a prophet and a teacher, a mystical, holy, spiritual person. And this woman is coming to her with, to, to him with financial problems. He accepted a holy Jewish leader does not dismiss another person's physical needs. Now, obviously, she's asking him for a miracle because he has no money. Nobody has money. She's asking him to perform a miracle. And he says, what do you have in the house? That's because when a person does perform a miracle, you try to minimize the disruption of nature. Since nature is God's design, it's there for a reason, for a purpose. So to disrupt it is like playing with fire. So even when they do perform a miracle, they try to minimize the disruption of nature. So Alicia says, give me something that you have that I can work with. But to make money appear out of, out of the air, that's too much of a violation of nature. So let's start with something that already exists. She says, I have nothing in the house except a pitcher of oil. He says, okay, then the oil will have to be the miracle. The pitcher will have to become a well of oil. So go out and borrow vessels, empty vessels, as many as you can, and you will pour into all of those vessels from your oil pitcher. Then you should close the door before you start. Why is that important? Because a miracle is a holy event and holiness demands privacy, modesty. Again, you don't want the miracle to be a greater disruption of nature than is absolutely necessary. And if people see the miracle or hear about the miracle, it, disrupt, it disrupts nature more than is necessary. So keep it private. Now, of course, a miracle like the splitting of the sea was meant to be public. But a miracle that occurs to an individual, it's best to keep it private. At least till after the fact. So she goes and she borrows the vessels and she closes the door. Her children are handing her the vessels and she's pouring. Then she says, hand me another vessel. And the son says, we don't have any more vessels. And the oil stops. What is the Torah telling us? That the oil would not have stopped even though the vessels were full. What caused the oil to stop? Somebody said, her son said, we can't handle any more of this blessing. We have no more vessels. When you can't handle any more, that stops the miracle. Otherwise, the miracle can go on indefinitely. So she sells the oil and she pays her bills. And she and her children live on the profits that are left. That's the simple story. A woman lived a long time ago. She had a problem, her problem, not my problem. And Alicia was able to help her. Now, if we add a little bit of Hasidic insight, look what happens to the story. One woman is referring to the godly soul because the godly soul in its relationship to God is like the wife. God is the husband and we are, we are the wife. The godly soul, of course, is one with God. 
not like the animal soul. So when the Torah says one woman, it means the soul that is one with God, the soul of oneness, that is the godly soul. When it marries a minor prophet, meaning when the soul comes down to earth and becomes like a minor prophet because it senses God's will but can't really express it the way a, a real prophet can. So he's a minor prophet, every soul. But when it comes down into this world and becomes a minor prophet, it cries. It goes into shock. Who does it cry to? It cries to Elisha. Elisha, if you break it into two words, means my God who responds. Shah means respond. So every soul, when it comes down into a body, cries to God about what? My husband, your servant, can be understood as serving you with a godly fire. Because the word for husband, my husband, is ishi. That's the word ish with two yuds. So it's a godly fire. What is a godly fire? Love. So the soul says, now that I'm in a body with an animal soul, my serving you with love has died. Because the love of the animal soul kind of um, muddies up my love. So I don't know if I'm loving God, am I loving myself? Am I, am I loving the reward that I'm anticipating? It, it's messed up. It's not pure anymore. Also, serving you used to be with fear. In heaven, the soul experiences love of God and fear of God, pure and holy. But now the love is gone, and my fear that used to be is no, is no more. What's even worse is that the love and fear, which are the children of the soul, the, the collector, the Yetzirah, wants them to be his slaves. He wants all my love to be selfish. He wants all my fear to be selfish. So what is the soul crying about? The soul is saying, in heaven I had godly talents, godly abilities. Now I don't have them. What am I supposed to do? Yes, I can still do a mitzvah, but I've got nothing to put into the mitzvah. No love, no fear. So I can't fill the mitzvah with, with kavana, with intention, with, 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 with any value. So doing the mitzvah is going to be like an empty vessel, like a body without a soul. God says to the soul, so what do you have left in the house? The love is gone and the fear is gone. Well, you have 10 faculties. What about the other eight? And the soul says they're all gone. For every holy trait, there's an equal and opposite unholy trait. So it's all compromised. It's all messed up. The only thing left is the oil pitcher. Oil in a pitcher. That represents the, the soul in a body. Why is the soul referred to as oil? The body can be compared to a, to a pitcher 
because a pitcher is a container and the body is the container for the soul. But why is the soul compared to oil? So we find that there are three liquids, water, wine, and oil in nature. The difference is water is obvious, it's everywhere, it's visible, it's available, and, and it's essential to life. You can't live without it. Wine is not everywhere and it's not visible. It's not essential to life. It's hidden in the grape. And to get the, oil, the wine, you have to squeeze the grapes. Then there's oil in the olive. The oil in the olive is much more hidden, much more um, unavailable because to squeeze oil out of an olive is really, really difficult. You can't do it by hand. The same is true with the soul. In your soul, you have the water, the wine, and the oil. The water is the, the visible, obvious parts of the soul. It thinks, it feels, it functions, it speaks, it communicates. Then there's the wine, and that is your intentions. The love, the fear, the, com the conviction, the understanding, the devotion. Those things are not so visible and they take a lot of effort to get to. Then there's the oil. The oil is the essence of the soul. The essence of the soul means what you are essentially. That is the deepest part of the soul. It's very core, it's very identity. So now this soul comes down into a body and the soul is crying. I've lost my wine. Yes, I can still do the mitzvah, the water part I can still do. Everyone can do it, but I don't have any wine to fill the mitzvah with. A mitzvah should be filled with love, with fear, with, with awe, but I don't have it. It's gone. And the soul should cry. It is a loss. But God says to the soul, I know, I know. Of course, you're going to lose the wine. You're going to lose the love and fear as you come into this world. I knew that was going to happen. And it's okay. Instead of filling the, the mitzvah with your love and your fear, which is human and, and tiny, pour your oil into the mitzvah. Do the mitzvah that feels like an empty vessel because you have no love and fear. It feels like you're borrowing it from a stranger. It's not even yours. It's a foreign thing. You put on tefillin. What, what in the world are you doing? You light a Shabbos candle. You, you've got electric lights. You don't need a candle. So God says, now, it's not the love and the fear that I'm looking for. I want the oil. The oil means that's who I am. It's not what I love and fear. It's what I am. So God is saying, pour yourself into the mitzvah. I don't need your love or your fear. What I want is you. So put yourself into the mitzvah. Give yourself to me. In our, in our history, we have had endless experiences of self-sacrifice, where people who would refuse to give up their Jewish identities at the cost of their lives. Our history books are full during the Spanish Inquisition, um, in the times of the Romans, throughout history, even most recently, um, this, this indestructible Jewishness of a Jew 
who maybe didn't love God and didn't fear God. But to stop being Jewish was unthinkable. Daniel Pearl, for example, they were going to kill him. And his last words were, my parents are Jewish, I'm Jewish. That's what came to the surface in the last minutes of his life. Should anyone doubt who I am, I'm telling you, my father's Jewish, my mother's Jewish, I'm Jewish. So when the, um, the simple Jew, the unlettered Jew, does a mitzvah, he doesn't know about all the, you know, the small print, all the scholarly works and thoughts, all the kavana and intentions that you're supposed to have. All he knows is, I am a Jew, this is what a Jew does. So when he does the mitzvah, it's himself that he's putting into the mitzvah because he has nothing else. So God says to the soul, even if you had love and fear and wisdom and understanding, and appreciation of the holiness and spirituality and the godliness of it. That's not really what I want. I just want you, like the simple Jew who does a mitzvah, because that's me. So when you do the mitzvah for, God says, when you do the mitzvah for me, all I want in that mitzvah is you. Put yourself into my mitzvah and we become one. The reason I'm mentioning all this is because we seem to be going through that experience today. God seems to be saying, you've lost sight of who you are. You don't appreciate who you are. You're not comfortable with yourself. And that's why, to some degree, you're not comfortable with your family, with those closest to you. Well, all I really want is you. So no parties, no traveling, no going, no tumult, no, no, dra no dramatic uh, scenes, just you. Stay home and be you. Get comfortable being you because that's all that matters to me, is that it's you. So when you do a mitzvah, don't do it because it's what the community expects. Don't do it because everybody's looking. Don't do it to uh, fit in with the community. I don't want that. I don't, I don't need that. I don't even need your love and your fear. I just want your oil. If we think about this, we can gain a lot during this time of quarantine and isolation. Get comfortable with you, because that's all that God wants. You is awesome. You are awesome. The you is awesome in God's eyes. God wants a relationship with you. And intimacy in a relationship means this is me and I'm giving it to you. Here is me for you. God does that when he gives us the Torah. God said at the giving of the Torah, you know what this is? Not a book, not a Bible. This is me bearing my soul to you. I give myself to you. And he expects that we will reciprocate and give ourselves to him. This is really something beyond the human realm. 
and we are now ready to take that step to become something more than just human, to become not only a partner in creation, but to become one with God, like in a really good marriage. We merge. What you want, I want, what I want, you want, we become one. That takes a little adjustment, but it is possible. And that's what prepares us for Moshiach. So here's the punchline of the story. She sells the oil, and with the profits left over, she can feed herself and her children. The children, we said before, is a reference to love and fear. The love and fear that had become contaminated, spoiled, muddied by the love and fear of the animal soul or the Sahara. Now, after pouring your oil into the mitzvah, now your love and your fear will, will blossom. You see, if you love me, but we're not really married, that's nice, because everybody loves love, but it doesn't bond us. So if we're not married, your love doesn't really mean much. As far as intimacy is concerned. Yes, we all love being loved and we all love loving, but that's rather impersonal. Anyone who would love me, I would love them back. And anyone I love, I want them to love me back. But when you pour your oil into the mitzvah, if you are mine, now your love and your fear become so much more meaningful. So God is saying, I don't need love, but if you're mine, then your love I do need. If you're mine, then every part of you suddenly becomes infinitely valuable. But first be mine. Then every talent you have will become wonderful. So instead of saying, I love you, you say, you, because you're mine, you I love. That's a completely different love. That's a completely different bonding agent. That brings us together. So you see the story in the Torah about a woman who happened to be married to a prophet whose name was Ovadia, who had debts. All of a sudden, it's not about some strange woman who lived a long time ago. It's suddenly about me, my soul, my place on earth, what I'm doing here. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects, but that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on, if you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock. Well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock a more informal chat, which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it. <laughs>